three, two, one. We are live for a new episode of the Electric Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host. And as usual, I always have Seth Wintraub, co-founder and publisher of Electric with me. How are you doing this week, Seth? I'm good. All right. Let's jump right in because we have a bunch of interesting news to start with. And as it has often been the case on the Electric Podcast for the last, well, for the whole year, really, <laughs> uh, we discussed some Tesla pricing news. And this time, it's a price increase, and it's a weird one because uh, the amount is weird. This, uh, well, uh, the, the fact that it's an increase in itself is also weird because the it's been a lot of price decreases over the last uh, four or five months. And so it's an increase, and it's an increase of 250 bucks on all configuration of Model 3, Model Y. So it's the smallest amount yet, uh, and... Um, and it's it's an amount that has never been seen for an increase or a decrease before. So it's just like a, just this tiny little thing that is hard to understand. We know that Tesla has been saying now, and Elon made it clear on the last call, uh, earnings call, that Tesla is tracking very closely every day production capacity against orders, and they find that the best way to adjust the demand to the production capacity and to increase those orders. Is, or to decrease them is to adjust the price. And for the last five months, that, that is meant to decrease the price for the most part and now increase it by $250. It's hard to understand just how significant of an impact it can have on uh, increasing or in this case, decreasing orders, uh, I guess, since uh, it's, it's an increase in price. But... Um, my only thing that I could think about is the inventory. So we we reported last week that Tesla's inventory has reached a new high, um, that it is becoming a problem to to a certain degree. Like it's not normal for Tesla to have that much inventory. And when Tesla changes a price on its configurator, it most often than not changes the price on its inventory vehicles because I'm talking about new inventory, so it's not. It, it, it's a new car. So you're still eligible to the federal tax credit in the U.S. Uh, as a new vehicle. And this time, Tesla didn't do that. Is it? Did, did it just didn't do that because it's just two hundred and fifty dollars, or does it sort of ends up being a tiny little discount on inventory vehicle? Again, it's so tiny that would it really do a difference? I doubt it. But at the same time, it's sort of a double like benefits of like if you find an inventory vehicle that you like and there are like i said quite a few available right now you have both the benefit of um having the vehicle faster because it's in, in inventory it's there right now or it's whatever however close it is to your location and then on top of it you get 250 dollars off uh i don't know any theories there said yeah i don't know 250 doesn't seem like even much of a i mean that's like not even what <clears throat> the uh, state, uh, you know, the delivery charges and all yeah. that other stuff. Like it's, it's, I don't know. Maybe they're going for press. Maybe they're like, hey, we, we need to get in the press this week, or hey, we need to be shown right raising prices as well as lowering prices. I don't know. Yeah, that that last one maybe a little bit. Like it's it's sort of like look or order rate, like as because. With the inventory news and all that, people are starting to think, okay, this is there's a demand problem. So maybe this is a sort of an indicator. Like, look, it's not really a demand problem because we're increasing prices. But for for the news thing, I mean, beyond like specialized media like ourselves, I don't think a lot of me mainstream media is picking up uh, uh, such a small price increase like that. Right. Yeah. Because I've seen a lot of people having that theory too. But yeah, this, so um, we're, we're kind of scratching our head a little bit on this one, like what's happening with this price increase. Um, but a few other interesting, ooh, what's happening with this page right now? Shaking all over the place. Uh, the Model 3 long range, actually we did discuss that. Like, well, this is so, do you see that, Zed? It's not as bad, I think. It just huh? it looks like a flutter. Okay. Um, so we talked about it last week. Tesla still hadn't um, reopened orders for the Model 3 long range. And we were questioning ourselves why, what's happening. Of course, Tesla's narr narrative since the beginning, but that was like a, over a year ago at this point, is that the demand was too high for it, which started making less and less sense uh, over the last few months. But now they relaunched it, and they relaunched it uh, was happier to be 
a Model 3 built in the US with Chinese cells, most likely LFP cells, like the standard range version, uh, though it's not, it's not clear. But uh, it does come with a reduced range of... Uh, 325 plus. Yeah, so not there. That probably means that EPA is not uh, con uh, is is not solid just yet, but they expect yeah. it to be three twenty five. But that's about uh, thirty miles less than the previous version with the uh, the uh, the nickel base uh, cells. Other than that, not that many things change. Uh, of course, now the tax credit. Well, I mean, the tax credit was not it wasn't available before, so it it's nothing. not like it changed, but. Uh, right. It is half of the full credit, which is the thing that point us to it being from uh, Chinese cells. Now, the fact that it would be from Chinese cells would likely mean that it would be LFP cells because there is not that much value for Tesla to um, import cells from China if it's not going to be LFP because you, you would use another manufacturer at this point in order to get the full tax credit because I doubt that you, you, there's like, um, how do I say this? Like a Chinese nickel-based cell would not uh, be worth the $3,750 to get it under than another supplier like that. The yeah. price difference from a Chinese supplier wouldn't be that big. So it, would, so it doesn't make sense unless you go with LFP. Uh, but you did find something, said I think that you thought that, okay, yeah, very cool weather. For the best long-range driving experience in the coldest regulation, we can recommend long-range or performance model 3. So this is what I think pointed you to. You think that might not be LFP cells because they don't perform as well? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. So that that's one part. And the, and the other part is obviously it's longer range than the LFP pack. So... It, maybe yeah. it's a, a optimized version of the LFP, and and we actually did a story on uh, different chemistries that Cattle was working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so that might be a possibility, or that might just be like a legacy message yeah, it's, from the it's page. Very possible that they didn't upgrade it, but this pack certainly has more uh, capacity, and I don't I don't know if there was a weight on that vehicle but um, um yeah so so the weight is the same as the long range from europe so uh it's not it's still a little bit confusing um when the epa does the epa tell no the epa doesn't tell you the chemistry of the pack but they will tell you the capacity of the pack so that would be interesting so from the capacity mm -hmm. of the pack we should have a good idea of the range uh because my assumption that it's probably going to be a similar capacity as the U, uh, last pack but if it's lfp it makes sense it would have a lower range because for the same capacity you have an if your weight less efficiency yeah but it's good to have uh, yeah. one more options uh, on the model tree lineup in the u.s what were you saying sir no it's interesting because uh you would think if it was a important pack you know, if they had an LFP pack that had the density of lithium, uh, uh, nickel, you know, Tesla would say something like, Hey, we, we got this great new pack or cattle would say, Hey, Tesla's mm -hmm. using our new technology. So it is weird that this just kind of came in under the radar. Yeah. But at the same time, Tesla is, uh, always like to keep their, their cars close to their chest, especially when it comes to batteries. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is annoying me right now. I don't know what's happening. Um, all right, the Model S Plaid track package has been released, and um, uh, it's a bit of a controversial one because, um, well, we knew it was coming, we knew that the ceramic brake upgrade for twenty thousand dollars was uh, the thing that was going to finally enable Tesla to get that 200 miles per hour top speed that was promised. That's the 323, 323 22 kilometers an hour, excuse me. And um, we reported last summer when someone actually achieved it, but by unlocking the speed limiter that Tesla has uh, in the software of the Model S Plaid, and uh, they had their home, of course, ceramic brakes at the time that they, they put in. But now Tesla is starting to ship uh, the, the upgrade that they were selling for $20,000. And they are adding to that the Model S Plaid track package, which sounds like is also going to be needed to achieve that new um, uh, that, that new top speed. So the 
package come with the zero G wheels that we've saw, we saw previously on the, on, on the Tesla Model 3 track package. So the same design, uh, the more performance tires, so the Goodyear Supercar 3R tires, and um, well, the valve nuts and everything. But the big difference, obviously, is the is the ceramic brakes that that are very much needed to uh, slow down that vehicle once it achieved that top speed. So why is that controversial? Is because when Tesla first started seeing the Model S Plaid, which two years ago at this point, they uh, they were promising that 200 miles per hour top speed, but they were saying through software update, um, they weren't saying through a $20,000 ceramic brake increase or a, a Plaid a track package a deal or any kind of uh, payment that would have to be made to achieve that top speed. So uh, I've talked to uh, two different owners about this, MLS Plaid owners. We're a little bit frustrated by it because they feel like Tesla is now asking them for $20,000 in order to get what they were promised originally, which I tend to agree with. I think that that's fair. Uh, I asked those two owners to tell Tesla that because I think it's pretty straightforward. Like if Tesla promised that top speed through software update, um, the, um, the, 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 well, that, the, that's the controversial part. So they should, you, you would think they, they could just do it instead and remove the speed limiter but at the same time, like when um, in Gen X, we did it by themselves, removing the speed limiter, when they were starting to have early discussion about offering that as a product to MLS plat owners, uh, Tesla was like, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. It's dangerous. <laughs> um, so I would assume that it's also dangerous for Tesla to do it themselves uh, without the, the brake upgrades or the right tires and, and, and wheels. So I... I Think that probably the only right thing to do for Tesla would be to offer those upgrades for free to people that order the Model S Plaid before they had, because now they have added uh, a mention of with the appropriate brakes and, and wheels uh, or tires or wheels and tires. I don't know uh, exact phrasing. Uh, I could look it up actually. That would uh, that would make sense. So uh, I asked them to to check out with Tesla if uh, if they're gonna do something about it. But if they don't, I think that's a, a big customer service uh, mishap. And it's, it's no, no more than that. It's straight up false advertising, really. I don't think there's a, there's a way around it. So if I go my last plan and I go um, the top speed is not even mentioned here. Interesting. Where is it mentioned? Oh, do I uh, no, if you upgrade the wheel, that's the aren't Nick wheels. There's no mention of the top speed if you order a new Model S plan right now. Interesting. Uh, if I go feature details, um, top speed, Model S plan, 200 miles per hour. Okay, it does say it here. Requires paid hardware upgrades. So now it, it does say it. It says uh, this indicated plat top speed requires paid hardware upgrades. So the uh, now they, they put it in there. But for the people that bought it without this, um, also this is a fine print there that I. <laughs> it's not not an ideal situation either. But yeah, I think it would be fair for for them to get it included because that's that was the deal. Do you agree with that, Seth? I mean, yeah. It's like that, uh, you, you get what you pay for, I guess. I don't know. Like, uh, this is out of my kind of league in terms of, you know, buying a, uh, a supercar, uh, basically. Yeah, supercar. Uh, well, I, I also, I would argue that people that bought this when originally probably paid a lot more for it too than people That's buying right. now because the price was much higher. So yeah, price came down. Uh, when you combine that with the with the fact that Tesla wasn't saying that you well, you were going to need a paid hardware upgrade, I think it's fair. We always get in trouble for uh, defending. <laughs> yeah, like we should ask Elon. Hey, can you hook these guys up and then have six thousand yeah. Elon, well, Elon fans after us? Last time that we're in trouble is because it was affecting me personally too at the same right. time. So people attacked me on that. That that was a weird thing, right? Because 
if you remove the fact that it was affecting me personally, it was still the right thing to do. I but the so. fact that it was the right thing to do and it benefited me, <laughs> like, no, 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 that's not, you cannot, you cannot do the right thing if it benefits you also. <laughs> that was Which, a good one. I, I think we would have done the same thing if we hadn't, uh, if you I, would, I would think so. I, yeah. And the fact that it was like, because it was so clear to me is because also I was in, in Canada. So like the Model 3 performance came a little bit later. So like they gave me my car and right away, like they, re, they, they dropped down the price. even though I was waiting for my cars for two years. So yeah, it was kind of like more flagrant for me a little bit, but it affected everyone the same way on that. In this case, it does affect me personally. I don't have a Model S plan, but <laughs> anyway. Why not, Fred? Yeah, I, I, I almost, I came pretty close at one point really? to get a plot. Yeah, yeah. There was one, a uh, used one. Uh, I was negotiating. And back when the the used car prices for the for Tesla was like insane. So I still had a good price on my Model 3. So I was going to exchange it for the plot. But I, at the end of the day, I was still going to have to like pull like $60,000 out of the pocket or something like that. So I decided not to. Yeah, um, I, I actually came close to getting a Model X plaid. When I say close, I mean I was thinking about it for a few minutes. But uh, <laughs> a Google employee I know uh, had one. He he had purchased one and didn't want it anymore for some reason. And he was like, "Hey, do you want it for what I paid?" And I think it was a good price at the time. And I was thinking about it, but then I was like, "No, that been a tough one to pass by the wife, though." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although she does uh, like the she Model did X. like the Model X, though. Yeah. Right? Then you had one, yeah. Yeah, the, the, it's so hard to justify a Model X Plaid because it's just like it's the same as a regular Model X, just super car speed that you are basically never going to use. Right. Um, all right, uh, moving on to the next news. Now, this is, was a little exclusive from Electrek here that Tesla is building a new lithium lab in Nevada. And it's not what you think. It's not Gigafactory Nevada. It's in Sparks, just like the Gigafactory, but it's in downtown Spark or if, if there's a downtown in Sparks, but it's in the town of Sparks, which is uh, directly adjacent to uh, Reno, instead of uh, in the in the boonies, like a gift factory in Nevada. So uh, we found that out through a building permit application that Tesla had on, on this little building here. Oh, yeah, like I can show you on the map too, like it's in Spark, like Reno's right here. Spark, it's like in this little industrial park. And uh, there's not a lot of information. Tesla is calling it the Tesla Lithium Lab, and it's a manufacturing R&D lab. And it, Tesla says a tenant improvement project for the purpose of a manufacturing R&D Lithium Lab facility. The scope of work includes mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and minor architectural upgrades to support tool installation and process optimization. So from that, we can, and from the name of it, obviously, it could be a few things. So we know that Tesla is building this uh, lithium processing facility to produce lithium uh, hydrate out of uh, Corpus Christi in Texas. Uh, so it might be related to that process where there's a novel one that Tesla is using there. So maybe some uh, work that's related to that. But the fact that it's in Nevada would maybe point that it's more related to maybe their mining operation for lithium that Tesla is supposed to be doing in Nevada, though there hasn't been any updates on that since the, well, there's been a little bit of talk, but not much since the battery day when Tesla announced that they acquired like 10,000 acres of uh, mining rights in Nevada, which is known for have, like there's a, a big lithium deposit there. Um, lithium America is, is exploiting it, but a few other companies have rights around the place, including now Tesla. And Tesla was supposed to develop their own technique to, um, extract the lithium from the uh, from the ore, and uh, this lab might be related to that in order to refine the process and make sure that it works. Uh, those are my two guesses. I don't know if anyone has other guesses. If you do, you can put it in the comment section right now. But it's interesting that this has a new facility in Sparks, and it's called the Tesla Lithium Lab. Quiet, quiet in the comments right now. We usually have quite a few by now. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, we're going to have plenty of time. This this week was kind of a slow news week. We still have a few news items to discuss, but uh, if you guys have any questions, you can put in the comment section below or any subjects you want us to get into. Uh, we have, we're going to have plenty of time to talk to you guys uh, today. So uh, get on it. 
All right, this was this is not like a, a big story, but it was the biggest story of the week. Interestingly, like, like 300,000 hits on it. So I guess we should discuss it because people find it very interesting. And it is somewhat, there's a, <laughs> a little interesting thing about it really is the, um, so it's these three brand new, like never driven Roadster, original Roadster, first generation, uh, that have been found sitting in a container in China for over a decade. So the, the story comes courtesy of uh, Gruber Motors. Uh, if uh, you guys remember Gruber Motors, they're sort of specialists into reviving uh, roadsters that have like brick battery packs or any other issues. They, they, they specialize in fixing roadster really and uh, specialize in burning them down <laughs> a little bit. I'm yeah. just joking. Like, <laughs> I'm sure. They but, don't specialize um, in it, but they seem to like they had two separate happens. fires. Yeah. And they also burned a T0, which is yeah, know, a prototype T0. Yeah. Um, yeah, they had two separate fires that burned, uh, I think, at least two dozen cars, if I, know, if I remember correctly. So that also contributes in making the Roadster a little bit rarer and, um, and making strategy. these. Yeah, but now, like, the, okay, so they were part of making a few of them disappear <laughs> over the years. Now they were part of finding new ones, well, at least not necessarily finding, but they are, like, kind of managing a, a little bit this, uh, this project here of this guy in China that found these um, these three roadsters in a container that were like, sitting there like so so some guy was imported them back in 2010 uh, from the US uh, to probably to sell them in the Chinese market but the uh, they never picked them up from the port and it just sat there uh, just accruing fees from from uh, the port and uh, I guess some guy got involved now and settled the fees I assume for for a deal, otherwise he's gonna lose some money because uh, I'm sure ten years worth of fees it's uh, it's no joke. Um, so now he's he's trying to sell them and he reached out to Uber Motors uh, originally, I guess for to to fix them because the electric vehicles sitting there for ten years there's gonna be a and especially the Roadster has been known to have a bricking problem with their their pack. So if the pack was never plugged in, um, it's gonna be an issue. So we don't know for a fact right now. Gruber says that they just don't know the condition and they won't know until they have access to the car. And the cars are still in China, though they will be shipped to the U.S. within the next week or two unless they are sold somewhere else because they put them up for sale already uh, as in, uh, sorry, as is. So it's just for someone that's willing to take the risk. Um, so obviously, they are in great physical condition, but they are most likely than not, they are bricked. So it's just... Uh, beautiful ornament at this point so i wasn't so sure like who's going to be interested in buying those uh but uh today we uh we got the news from groovers that they already received five different um, bids for it including one for half a million dollars for all three uh so quite the high bid and i reached out to pete gruber the owner of gruber motors Asked him, are, are serious as those bid? And he was like, pretty serious. And not only that, he thinks it's actually low and he believes that he's going to sell for a million dollars all three. And um, the way I mean, he... Yeah. I mean, for collectors, these are zero mile cars. Like, I don't think these exist anywhere, really. Yeah, that was his argument. Uh, but again, they are brick, though. So you're really just having them as uh, as ornaments, like... To put it in your collection, or you could send them to space. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And the red one is the same one as the. Yeah. As, uh, no, I think it's not. It's a soft top. Uh, is it a soft top? I think so. You know, don't really I mean, it's it. like those you know original iPhones that sell for fifty thousand dollars or whatever. Yeah, that's fair. So, good boy. So yeah, uh, an interesting story. They found those, and now um, if you have a million dollars, they can be yours, probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not if you're like if you're already a car collector, you're basically betting on what cars are going to be collection items. And the road story is probably a good bet, just for its historical value of, in my opinion, being a major. A contributor to the resurgence of electric vehicles in in, in the 2000s um, that combined with uh, obviously the biggest thing for collectors is rarity is scarcity yeah scarcity yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is a fairly rare car at this point 
probably fewer than 2,000 units, I would say. Like, I think it's 2,400 or so total that were produced. But, I mean, one's in space, a bunch of them burned. <laughs> but uh, there's also just regular, like, use. And after a while, it's just not a usable car and or not a nice one, at least. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a good bet. And if you have three like that and you can make a deal, like, I'll buy three, well... It's pretty good bet where you, oh, I'll keep one in my collection because then if you're a car collector, that's and if you're a big one like, uh, um, like uh, what, what's his name, uh, the chin, hmm? <laughs> uh, the oh Jay Leno, Jay Leno. <laughs> I was gonna say Jared Leno for some reason. I knew it was wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jay Leno. I should, I should know Jay Leno, of course. Uh, like it's hard to get rid of your cars when you have like emotional attachment to, to them. I, actually, I don't know if G, uh, Leno sells them. You know, he's such a big fan, and he, he literally has like four warehouses full of cars at this point. But if you want to make it like an investment, also like you want to keep one, it's a good deal. Like you, you, you keep one and you sell those when they accrue some value, and maybe they, they pay for the the one that you keep pays for itself at this point. So I don't know. Might be a good deal. I don't have the million dollars to make a bet on this. Yeah. Maybe they'll trade it for a new roadster. A non-existent new roadster. <laughs> a new roadster reservation. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ford is... Uh, that's interesting that the Ford... Just just last week, we were talking uh, about Jim Farley, CEO of Ford, sort of warning Tesla about this this price war that they launched and that how it can, it can becomes a problem. And uh, now they are following through with more price cuts on the Mustang Mackey, and um, also reopening orders because uh, they, uh, they they did uh, shut them down for a while because they had to slow down production because of uh, tooling at the Mexico factory. So, like I think last month or last month or last quarter, yeah, last quarter they just sold five thousand units. So that's very low for them. Uh, but now they're trying to ramp things up, and they do it with. Um, Lower pricing. So we have the chart here. Uh, so through uh, 1,000 to 4,000 price cuts across the entire lineup now starts at $43,000 for the uh, SEDEC uh, rear wheel drive standard range. And uh, if you want the fully equipped uh, GT all wheel drive extended range version, now start at $60,000 instead of $64,000. So and all, decent... all, all Mach E's are eligible for $3,750. So just half the. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so below forty thousand now it starts after tax credit. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's starting to get uh, some. So you, you can see that what's driving this, obviously, uh, Mackie and Model Y are probably the closest competitor in this. Uh, when you when you want all electric SUVs crossovers, uh, they they are the closest. So the big price cut that Tesla has done over the year, over the since the beginning of the year. Yeah, they already did one shortly after the big one in in January, and now they're following again, following these two significant one that was uh, that were done last month by Tesla. <laughs> this is annoying. I cannot click on anything. Uh, I'm gonna have to figure that out. Um, you a space bar or something? No, I don't know oh, what's happening. I think it might be the the, the screen sharing thing. I don't know. Yeah. I wasn't doing that when it was working earlier before sh sharing the screen. All right, uh, Fisker. Fisker is starting the deliveries of the Ocean electric SUV in Europe. That's so great. they did the first uh, deliveries in uh, in Denmark, yeah, in Copenhagen. Isn't that where, where Fisker's from? Isn't he a Danish guy? Uh, that would make sense, I think so. He looked look Danish. He's tall, he, uh, pale, uh, like light uh, hair. Um. Yeah, so it's a good step. Like it's not this is this is something to celebrate because EV startups they are often a lot of talk, a lot of money invested, and not a lot of production vehicle. Obviously, this Fisker we we kind of knew always knew that they would reach production because of their deal with Magna. So Magna is in charge of production, and Magna has a lot of experience being car to production. And we do like that for Fisker, knowing what happened last time. Uh, like the the manufacturing engineering part of things was not was not a forte, let's say. Uh, so now that they have a big partner, that that helps. However, I'm still uh, I'm not very hyped up by the like the prospect of it. It's a 
They go, so they're going to sell 5,000 of Lem Lunch Edition for $69,000. I, I find that a little bit expensive for like uh, for that vehicle. Uh, like, I just, I'm thinking as a consumer, like, why would you want this over like a fully equipped Model Y or Mustang Mackie? We just discussed the Mackie's like 10,000. And also, that those are the European prices too, I should say. Um, they haven't confirmed when how it's going to come to the u.s market uh no that well is this so we're using the prices here for europe or because this is in dollars no, we didn't put euros so that no, might be the u.s prices is just uh yeah but the ocean was supposed to come in at really low prices like the, yeah no the, the sport Ocean's one is 37 500 but those are theoretically going to come much further along down the road. Yeah, yeah. This is going to take a while if they do get there because uh, if you look at the financials at Fisker, it doesn't look good right now. They're going to need more money because uh, I don't... So so my problem is like if I look at them, it's like nice, they get to production, but they're, they're going to... They, what Fisker does then is... Okay, so they are part of the design and engineering of the vehicle, not the production. Okay. But then they're still in charge of all the selling of the vehicle, the servicing of the vehicle and all that. And I know they're partnering with companies on this, but we know how big of a burden that is. We've seen it with Rivian, which I think most people agree that in terms of uh, startup, EV startup, again, Tesla is not an EV startup in my head anymore. Like, so <laughs> sometimes I, I say that, like, uh, Rivian really is the best EV startup. What about Tesla? Like, Tesla produced 2 million vehicles a year now. This is not a startup anymore. But yeah. so in the wave of Tesla of EV startup that came after Tesla, uh, Rivian is like often cited as the most advanced one and the the, the best one so far. Uh, and they are they are seeing a ton of pressure from reaching production, reaching volume production, and now having to sell and service and warranty these cars. This is a huge financial pressure, and Rivian at least as the coffers to do that. They have a ton of money to do it. I still have my worries about them uh, for the gross margin and all that. But they, they have at least the, the money to survive uh, in, for a while while they try to improve that. Fisker doesn't have that any, right right now. So they, they're gonna, they need a quick turnaround on this on making this business profitable. And I, I, I'm having issues seeing it. At this point, I'm open to discussion about it. If you, if there are any Fisker investors out there right now in the chat, they want to debate me on this, <laughs> go ahead. But uh, I have like just serious doubts, guys. Serious doubts. I and it, it's like Rivian. Like I love the product. Product is great, but it won't save them at the end of the day if they cannot make it profitably and they cannot service them profitably and deliver them and all that. So it's the same thing with Fisker. Though I, I cannot say I like the product just yet. I've never. Put my hands on it. Is he just a giant, or the the, the car is like super short? <laughs> it's a little tall. both. Yeah, he's a tall guy, but the car is also not. Yeah. Kind of looks like a Chevy Bolt there. I don't know. Yeah, even shorter. Like the Chevy Bolt is like narrow but pretty tall. Yeah. All right. Uh, speaking of AV startup, let's see if I can click on. There you go. Um, Aptera had a big update this week, and the uh, they had their. Um, uh, meeting with shareholders where they share the uh, production progress that they are making, uh, and uh, they are they, they just came back from their trip in, in Italy where, where they're going to be producing the bodies of uh, of the Aptera solar electric vehicle, and uh, they um, they have the entire dies. I don't know if you can say dies because it's a carbon. It's a, it's a very interesting process. Really, they are making it. They're using uh, C. Uh, do we have it? CPC? No, CEC, that's the money. CPC, I want to say. CPC, yeah. CPC Group, who makes, they are in Italian, they make supercars, all the carbon fiber supercars is their, pro, their, their uh, old process that they make the bodies with. And that's going to be what they make the body of the Atera, which is obviously not a supercar. But it's an interesting approach because a lot of supercars are, have incredible aer aerodynamic performance, and that's the goal of the Aptera. So using similar process, so extremely light body uh, and very simple frame too. The old teardor teardrop shape, very interesting. And um, so look at that. So it's really cool. Like they, they just pour 
um, the carbon fiber, like uh, it's almost like a goo or like a Play-Doh type of texture. And then they squish it like that and then they form it really quickly. And they can produce a part in like eight minutes of forming like that. Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly recent carbon process that they're doing that uh, hasn't been used before. It's not like uh, when uh, BMW did the iTree, for example. I don't know if you remember that, but that was like an insane process to make the body on this. So this is a much more heavens uh, carbon-based um, body structure. Very interesting. Now, they still need some money to make it to production. They're not quite there yet. They got the, we reported on the California Energy Commission, giving them uh, $21 million in grants to uh, establish a production line. And the accelerator program that they were doing at the same time, which is already at uh, over $14 million. But they think that they're going to need about $50 million to get to uh, production within the, nine, the next nine months. And I actually decided to participate in it. Uh, you guys know I've been very hyped up on Aptera for a while now. And uh, I decided to contribute to the accelerator program, which gives you the opportunity to get one of the slots for the first 2,000 vehicles. So I get a slot for the 2,000 vehicles and also invest in the company at the same time. Are they going to deliver it to you in Canada or you got to? You have to pick it up at the factory uh, for the accelerator program. So I'm going to have to do a little road trip. It's going to be fun. I, I want the 600 mile version anyways. <laughs> it's going to be easy to do the road trip and the supercharger network is going to work with it. Uh, hopefully by then there's going to be more stations open. Uh, hopefully it's summertime. I mean, hopefully it's sunny days. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sunny. I, I'm not. I, I'm not hyped up for Aptera because of their solar right. capacity. I'm hyped up because of the efficiency aspect, and that's what's cool about it. The efficiency aspect enables the solar thing because right. now the solar is useful from the hyper efficiency of the car. So I'm really hyped up about the hyper efficiency, and I think it's sort of cool that with the hyper efficiency, well, you know what? We can put solar on it, and it's actually somewhat useful. Right. Not a ton useful, but I mean, here in the summer, I'll be able to just leave it outside. And for the most part, I'm not doing 600 mile journeys all the time. So I'm just not going right. to be going to have to plug in the car, just leave it outside in the sun. And uh, yeah, part of the presentation too, they, they had very encouraging things to say about uh, how since, since it's going to be a car that people are going to leave in the sun a lot. And we know that the sun can be damaging on cars over time. Uh, they are taking a lot of approach on that front to uh, mitigate that and make it so that uh, this car is going to last a long time in the sun. Obviously, the entire like glass uh, structure for the solar cell is going to help on that. And on the rest of the body, it's uh, not painted, so it's uh, only wraps. So that helps too. But even wraps, like they don't last as much in the sun. Uh, so they're trying to find a, a, a wrap that's going to work well for extended period of times in the sun. So I think it has a chance of success. Um, but things that they need to accomplish besides actually producing them, like I think they really need to get the price down. Like, you know, the, the, I think the uh, the lowest priced one is like thirty thousand dollars. Twenty five, yeah, uh, or twenty, yeah. So um, the fact that you can, you know, you could almost get a Chevy Bolt, but like, I feel like under twenty thousand dollars in this, you know, two seater makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. um they also have to kind of convince people like the three wheel thing is is viable mm -hmm. um i think it is i think it like it works i've driven in a couple like electromechanicas and uh arcimotos and stuff and they they handle just fine um they're not you know they're not tipping over or anything but i think the general public hasn't gotten there you know they don't quite understand that yet and then um so the price down you know convinced about three wheels and then also safety like we don't know how this is going to crash test it doesn't have to crash test well it's basically yeah, that's a, motorcycle. a big difference yeah but you know if i'm going to be driving this thing around and you know somebody rear ends me and i'm over because somebody hit me going you know, 12 miles per hour then that that's not something i want to be a part of so no that's completely everything you said completely fair uh, in terms of the demand thing and the price i'm not so concerned about that i do think like for High volume, if they want to do like 20000 a year, like they're talking about, uh, yes, they would need to reduce the price at, at some point. But I think I think there's demand for, especially with, I think a lot of people are interested in this super high long range one, the 600 miles and the 1,000 mile version. And those come at a big premium, obviously. Um, but 
I think we we're gonna see a shift in the broader electric vehicle industry now of people that start thinking less and less about range, like longer range and more about efficiency. Um, and and uh, around that time, hopefully Altera is going to be up and running and they're going to be able to bring a version, lower range, but still very interesting for people because this is a commuter for the most part. You can go on road trips with it, obviously, like two people and use some, some cargo space in the back, but it's not really what it's meant to. I think it's going to be just a super efficient uh, commuter like this is basically between yeah if you want to do it by foot the commute by foot in a public transportation obviously very good then you have your bikes your e-bikes then you have your electric scooters and from there we jump to a car right now like a full-size car i think this is going to be like a new step in between uh, and but like you said for that step in between you're going to want a price that's in between that, that of a scooter and, and, and of a car and right now it's not really that uh, right. but I, I think the early adopters that are fan of uh, hyper efficiency like me and the solar aspect at the same time I think the, we should be able to close the gap with those people um, just like the Mercedes EQXX whatever like if you bring that to market um as a premium car, I think a lot of people would buy it just for the efficiency aspect of it. That's true. But, I, you know, I want to see this become a mass market thing. I want to see, like, hundreds yeah. of thousands. Yeah, then that, that's the goal, too. That's like what their Aptera is going after. And, uh, and they have an interesting approach for it because of that partnership with CPC making the bodies with the fact that they don't have uh, uh, to paint it, too, that that is a big deal like there's a reason tesla is doing that with the cyber truck it's it makes the deployment of a factory so much easier because like 80 percent of the environmental impact of a car factory is from the paint shops so if you can cut that down you cut down the entire process of building up a factory like significantly so that's a big deal so they're going to be able to like once they are up and running and they, it makes sense to make them in, in the us in california they can make factory in uh, in europe in asia and all that so yeah i, I might top uh, on it on uh as a potential cons uh, consumer and now as an investor i obviously i'm very like I, I wouldn't i wouldn't encourage anyone to invest in this any kind of money that you're not willing to lose obviously because it is a smart uh, it is a startup that is crowdfunding which is always an issue but when a lot of people like when I when I posted that I I participated in the accelerator program, I had a few people like uh, I invested in Atlas and uh, it, it's all screwed up now. So uh, I think it's not a good idea to do it in Aptera. Aptera and Atlas are like night and day for me. Like and the big part of that, I mean, the actual people buying the company and all that, I think is one thing too that like, to take into account. But even beyond that, just the fact that they. Atlas was trying to bring a pickup truck to market, and it's not even what they're doing right now. They're now sort of shifted into a, a strange battery company or battery cell company. Um, but bringing a pickup truck to market versus what is an auto cycle or um, a motorcycle, depending on which states you're at, it's completely different in terms of regulation and the uh, process to bring it to um, being certified to go on the road. So. I'm not too worried about that. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a neat looking car as well. Like the, Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And yeah. they're working with, uh, Coma, is it Coma AI? For Coma the, like, AI, uh, yeah. That's yeah, with Autopilot, cool. which I, mean, I haven't Smart used mode. Coma AI in a while, but I've used them, I want to say like five, six years ago, and I was impressed five and six years ago, and apparently they improved a lot, so... I'm like I wouldn't be mad to have them in in a car in the future. So I like Actually, that. Actually, I'm going to try to put it in the uh, the bolt. Oh, that could be interesting. Yeah. Is it one of the supported? So it's sort of vehicle? supported. You have to buy. It. So I should have got the I got the one LT. It's supported in the two LT bolt, but uh, you can get this thing called the pedal, which uh, you know it works on your accelerator pedal. Which I'm a little bit like, eh, I don't know about that, mm -hmm. but um. I can get that, and and actually, I've talked to some folks at um, Comma AI, and they said just buy it, and we'll re, you know, like, you know, you can say you returned it after or whatever, whatever. It, okay. So it's low risk for me. I tried it in the Tesla at one point too, like a yeah. bunch of uh, engineer here in Quebec uh, made it work in the Tesla, and it was impressive. And that was again, that was six years ago. I think they improved a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, the Bolt doesn't have any kind of uh, autonomous, so it's not like competing with like what's yeah. already built into it. No, that would make an interesting article because uh, I feel like Komoi AI is kind of the Android of self-driving right. of what Apple, uh, or what Tesla autopilot is to Apple. So yeah. All right, should we jump into the comments? I think we yep. uh, we gathered a bunch and since then. Yeah, boy. And yeah. maybe not so many because everybody's parting because it's Cinco de Mayo. That's uh-huh. a good point. Uh, Carl in San Diego, getting close to buying a BMW i4 because it's, mm-hmm. it's a car, not an SUV. Has a rear hatch, good driving dynamics and interior, and is in a Tesla. Do you guys have thoughts on the i4? Yes, I, I reviewed the i4. Mm-hmm. Um, I really enjoyed uh, riding it. Um, some things though that I didn't uh, particularly enjoy, like I, I didn't find the uh, you know autonomous software to be much more than uh, traffic aware cruise control. Um, it is like it's a four series car, so they have this huge front trunk. No, they have a huge front area, but like almost nothing. You know, there's nothing in there. Like it's a big waste of space. So uh, if you park it next to like a Model 3, you're like, wow, the Model 3 has this big cabin and a very small front area. And that front area is actually useful versus, you know, this BMW. Um, BMW is like very roomy in the front. Uh, the back is a little tight um, and not as much cargo space in the back. So that's comparing it to a Mo- Model 3, which is pretty much the only other electric EV car like sedan out there right now. Because every star. Yeah, the Polestar 2 is is good, and that's a great car as well. Um, so, I mean, drive the i4 if you love it, get it. Um, it's a mm-hmm. it's a great car. Um, if you know Tesla's out of the the question, then um, yeah, Polestar. I guess the EV6 is kind of a car. Yeah, ish. Yeah. I mean, it's lower than most uh, of the SUV type things out there. Uh, I've been seeing a bunch of uh, Ionic 5 too around, and like the more I see it, the more to me, like I know when, when you get it, like when you compare the dimensions, like it is kind of like a crossover SUV. It looks like a hatchback to me when hatchback, I see, especially yeah. when I see it from afar. I'm like, hey, what is that? Is that a hatchback? And then it gets closer. Oh, it's Ionic 5. Yeah. Uh, I was like, I'm everybody I know loves that thing, and I'm like, yeah, yeah I get it. I, it's kind of cool with the 8 bit lights and stuff, but mm-hmm. it just wasn't exciting to drive. Uh, where I, I, you know, I know it's the same, you know, underpinnings, but I really like the EV6. All right. Uh, MJ42 Kramer, when the refresh models come out, think they will still sell the older models until those sell out and those will be cheaper or refresh will only go on sale with the inventory of the old ones is zero. Historically speaking, it has been the latter. Tesla generally tried to get the inventory down ahead of a refresh release. Um it can be some overlap at times, obviously, but I think Tesla always makes it like very minimal. They're pretty good at that. And yeah, generally price uh, is used to to achieve that too. So keep an eye out on that if you're on the market. Yeah, now's not a bad time uh, to buy a Tesla. Transparent Utopia is the M3 long range, perhaps equipped with the same battery pack as the base Model Y. It just gets more range because it is a smaller form factor. I mean, mm. I don't think it's that much more range. And the the model well, the Y, the base, is... yeah, the base model Y in the U.S. would be the all-wheel drive standard range one, which is the forty-six eighty cell battery pack. So I don't, I don't think that's the case. Yeah, and and also it's like the different um, rebates, the battery tax rebates. So probably not the same. Uh, Carl in San Diego, Gruber will make those roadsters all work. It's what they do. Uh, well, th- that's the thing. Not this. Well, I mean, yeah, that's what they do. But uh, in this case, they are they are saying that right now they are basically just in the process of helping the owner sell them. Um, if the new buyers want to fix them, sure, I'm sure they will be willing to do that. But for now, what Pete told me today is that he thinks that whoever is going to buy them just wants to use them like as a zero mile like ornament basically like uh, in their collection uh mj40 kramer uh talking to talking about the i4 amazing it's basically the same price for the ionic 6 for a bmw oh that's another car the ionic 6 Mm -hmm. um 
which you know I think is pretty good. Uh, the hood seems very long. Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying. Um, I should note that one of my neighbors has uh, the M450 version of the i uh, the i4, and he can't stop talking about it. So, uh, that's is he a cool. new EV owner? Yeah, yeah, he's never yeah. owned an EV before. He had a, a Toyota Rav4 plug-in. The uh, plug-in version? Yeah, or his wife does. All right, uh, Carl in San Diego. Ford price cuts correspond with the LFP transition. Mm, a little bit. Uh, they did start to move to LFP on their standard range vehicles, but uh, the they, Ford cut the price across the board on their their, their vehicles. Yeah, and the LFP, yeah. LFP cells are coming from China now, so... Uh, they don't get the full tax credit until their uh, uh, cattle U.S. factory opens in, I think, 2026. All right. Fisker has better size and looks better than the Model Y. Uh, subjective, I would say. And has buttons and a display in the front of the driver. That's why I would go for Fisker over a Y. I mean, everything you just said is uh, objective other than the size. And I think you're wrong on the size, if I'm not mistaken. I think... There's more cargo space in the more wide in the Fisker. If I'm not yeah, mistaken. I mean, certainly it looked like it from the pictures. Yeah. Uh, question: Do we have any data on the reliability of the Rivian charging network? Is it as good as Tesla's? We don't right now, or it's not public as far as I'm aware. And also, it doesn't really matter at this point. There's I think Rivian does like a dozen stations or something like that. No, maybe less or a little bit more. Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about that until the network is uh, a little bit bigger. All right. Uh, forged carbon fiber production is a clever way to avoid hand intensive layup. Not sure if the Aptera system is similar, basically using chopped carbon fibers and random alignment instead of a weave. Uh, I guess forged carbon fiber, forge is the, it would be a good term for it. Uh, but chop carbon fiber, I don't, I don't know about that. I know, I know that the big thing is like there's basically zero waste because like, you, you put the exact amount of this like Play-Doh goo type of thing in, in those giant dyes and it's forged super fast. And then when you put it out, like you do maybe like a tiny little trim around it, but that's it. And you get able to produce a lot of like super solid, lightweight parts super fast that are super precise. So. No, it seemed like the right approach, and and you know what's interesting too is like that it might help that technology too to become a little bit more widespread because right now it's mostly used for supercars, but with the volume that Aptera plans to do if they are successful, it would be interesting to see this technology being used more. All right, Seth, why are you making a thirty thousand dollar Aptera sound expensive? They need to make some profit on their cars. Fair. I just if they want to get to mass market, they got to go down. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bolt was withdrawn from the market because it was unprofitable giveaway. I don't know if that's totally the case, but uh, it was withdrawn. So, uh, Nick Cedar, it was said that the i3's carbon structure would be totaled with mild damage. What about the Aptera? Uh, I mean, I don't know about total. Like, it's definitely going to be expensive to replace the panels. Like, the, the body is going to be an expensive part. Um, but. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's a super high concern of me. Like at this point, yeah, I wonder if it wouldn't be expensive because they can just make tons of those things and swap them out. Don't know. What yeah, do you think about? Still, it's still very much like a body panel type of vehicle. Like it's it's two very large panels on each side for sure. So like if you do break one of those, yeah, replacing it would be very expensive. But it's still a panel construction. Like it's not like a unibody type of thing either. Funny thing about the CF is that if you can try to lay up more carbon and make it strong, there just hasn't been much of a market for carbon repair in the auto industry. Yeah, I mean, fair. I know in the bike industry, like if you mm -hmm. if your carbon fiber bike breaks, there's no like it. I mean, and sometimes they shatter like glass. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the same thing, but um, you know, if your carbon fiber bike even gets like a small dent in it. It's just over. You get mm -hmm. a new frame. Uh, a pair of bodies should be cheap to replace whole parts. Moving the whole car's components to a new shell is doable, where it might be ridiculous with other cars. Maybe. Like Angelus, uh, question is, anyone making a mini Aptera, basically a tiny version, I thought the Aptera was already mini, 
uh, basically a tiny version of one that's more in the size of a Harley. Three wheel uses a third of the energy to propel one person or two in tandem, like a fighter jet cockpit. Yeah, that's basically a Can-Am or like a, a close enclosed Can-Am, I would say, because it sounds like you want an enclosed version. Yeah, it's going to be tight in there. It's already pretty tight inside. Um, I but guess... but I, I would, that's not a bad idea, though. I, I would think there's a market for that. And, uh, and at Terra, it was clear that like they, they want to take their design philosophy, which is like hyper-efficiency and solar, and bring it to a bunch of different, different segments. So I think that would be in their future, probably, unless they want to go bigger. I, I know that they're talking about the van, too. They want to do like a van that is like hyper-efficient with solar. So, so I think that would be their second car, their second, second vehicle, I should say. But let's focus on the first one. Like, yeah, they, let's get that. they barely like they every money that comes in right now, they use it for like the production, and that's what they're gonna do for the next nine months. So let's focus on that for now. Someone made a frunk aftermarket for the i4 rear wheel drive model. Not a bad idea. I'm sure it's yeah. very doable. There's tons of space in there. Fred, if you can imagine yourself in an Aptera traveling on Interstate 5 or 95 or CA1 surrounded by semis at 90, 80 miles per hour, you have more intestinal substance than I. Well, I would do that in a motorcycle, and that's even yeah. more scarier than an Aptera. So it's it's basically uh, you're in a motorcycle with it, you know, yeah, an outer shell. Yeah, and not better than a motorcycle, I would I would say. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I'm not too worried about that. And I, I I'm fully aware that like it's not as safe as a full size car, obviously. But, any comments on the Denver Supercharger suit shooting? Hope it's few and far between sort of incident. That was yeah. kind of crazy. Weird. Yeah, well, like I wrote in the article, I think it's it's more about, it says more about gun violence in the U.S. than it says about like the supercharger situation. And the police has kind of like walked back their statement a little bit, though it's not clear. Because at first they were like, it was an argument over a charging station. So like, that's more like, okay, like super charging etiquette is kind of involved in it. Uh, but then they said, and it wasn't about a charging dispute. They said both Tesla owners had guns, but like, okay, they both had guns, but then it's just, they were like, you have a gun, I have a gun. Let's have a shootout like this. So that, so the reason behind it is not clear either, but obviously it's extremely sad. And uh, I mean, this is uh, basically a fight over a parking spot. It doesn't like if the Tesla chargers yeah. weren't there, like these people were both trying to get in this parking yeah. spot. I mean, it was what it sounds like, yeah. at least initially. Uh, but yeah, the, I can... the argument, have you like to read the comments around this? Like, I cannot like, get into it. It's just crazy because people are like, yeah, well, this is good that it's getting publicized because now everyone knows, like, you, you need to be careful in the US if you have an argument because anyone can have a gun. Uh, like, which I guess is true. Like, you have to be careful. But is that really what you, what you want? You want your life to be like? Just like, be careful because everybody has a gun. Like, it's just, it's such a scary thing to have in mind. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think like that. Uh, but I, mean, I don't know. Maybe different parts of the country are different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't think that when I saw Denver, I was a little bit surprised about that too. I wouldn't yeah, think Denver. A... Like, it's pretty like. It's very much a like modern city. Uh, well, I shouldn't say my, everything is modern cities, but it's uh, my understanding is like even in the uh, well, Colorado is always like a swing between red states and and, and blue states. I think, but yeah. generally the cities like Denver is is pretty liberal for the most part. I think. Yeah, a lot of ski resorts. Uh, get a Twizy. So yeah, the Renault Twizy is kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, that um, not quite as aerodynamic, obviously, but it's a fighter pilot. I don't know what you call that front back mm -hmm. uh, seating situation. But, you know, I, I do like the Aptera model a little bit more. Like uh, uh, in the Twizy, I feel squeezed a little bit. I feel like I'm tall and, and thin. Like it, feel, it feels a little bit weird. Uh, and also, are those still, uh, still for sale? I know that in Quebec, they brought some at some point. Like Renault like, sold a batch. But Oh, did they? Yeah. Do they, does Renault so cars in like actively and not anymore not for a long time but i think they, they did something with the tweezy for a little bit man okay because i saw some tweezy here unless those people imported them and I, I i thought Renault was involved okay i was a while ago like this was like maybe like six seven years ago all right the other uh vander wall is a small electric three-wheeler that drives like a car yeah. um you know yeah, i, I say saw that 
the smaller ones, there's a couple bikes, like electric bikes that have like a cone thing around them. And because they're so hyper aerodynamic, the power uh, from an electric bike is enough to get them going like 60 miles per hour, which is, you know, really interesting because, you know, you have almost zero wind resistance or, you know, very little relative wind resistance. The, the amount of power that getting somebody to like 25 miles per hour is enough to get somebody to go to 60 miles mm -hmm. per hour. That's just, it's that's... been their hall too. It's not been their wall. But... Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Mini Aptera is Arkimoto, but no wind resistance there. The under hall. Yep. And, Question, and they're you... also not as efficient as the Aptera. Obviously it's not yeah. like the enclosed, enclosed wheels and, and like teardrop thing. It's just, uh... They're a little bit like fancier looking. All right. Uh, question. Do you think the cattle semi-state battery will go into production this year? What's semi-state? I think they had an announcement about a hybrid, like uh, solid state, not mm -hmm. solid state uh, hybrid battery. I must have missed that. Yeah, it was, it was part of their like big uh, yearly announcement or whatever. Uh, and then finally, Colorado is a microcosm of conservative versus liberal trying to share space. That makes sense. That makes sense. Smoke weed, don't shoot guns. That's what they do. Like Colorado is. <laughs> That's a, when I first thought about Colorado, I thought oh, the first state to legalize recreational marijuana and said, no, let's shoot each other. Anyway, stay safe out there, everyone. Thanks a lot for listening on this week's episode of Electric Podcast. We appreciate every single one of you. If you do appreciate this podcast, you can give us a thumbs up, a like, whatever it is on the app you're watching right now. We are live everywhere. And if you're listening to the podcast on the audio version, we're doing very good on the option top 10 in the automotive section um, on Apple this is awesome. Uh, and if you want to leave us like a review on there, a five-star review, that helps a ton. Only if you appreciate the show, obviously. And we read it, every single one of them. So thanks a lot. Uh, have a good Cinco de Mayo.